Good morning, everyone. Junior church, you are dismissed to walk. See, I told you it was coming, bud. <laughs> Don't you wish you could have the same excitement that they have? If you're going to go play on the equipment and not listen to me, I'm sure you would. So a man died and he met St. Peter at the gate. And Peter said, would you like a tour? And of course the guy said yes. And so he led him down this hallway through the, the heaven and he stopped at the first door and he opened it and he said, these are the Pentecostals. And then he closed the door and he walked on down and he opened up the door and he said, these are the Baptists. Closed the door and he walked on down and, and the guy was getting a little concerned like what's going on and he opened up the door and said this is the church of Christ Christian churches and the guy's like okay okay I need to know why are you whispering and Peter turned and he says because they all think they're the only ones here <laughs> Now, a lot of times we can laugh at that joke, but the sad truth of it is there are many people who believe that to be absolutely true. Years ago, the restoration movement had some slogans which were really good. Uh, one of them says, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And the whole phrase means, if it's in the Bible, we preach it and proclaim it. If it's not, it's opinion, and therefore it doesn't really matter. We can each have our own opinion. One of the better statements, I think, is, we are not the only Christians, but we desire to be Christians only. I don't care about your background. I don't care where you grew up and what church. Do you serve Jesus? Are you called according to his salvation? And if so, if you're following the precepts found in the scriptures, you're a Christian, and I am going to accept you as that. One, another one is, we have no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, and no name but Christian. Instead of all these other things, we're just going to focus on Christ. Those statements of faith say that if you agree in Christ, if we both stand on Scripture, if we both are trying to live out the disci and as disciples of Christ, then why would we ever be divided? There are lots of debates in the Christian realm. Here's just a few of them. Can churches have church service on Saturday nights? Should there be a dress code for people who go on stage? What type of music is appropriate for worship? Can a church get rid of the Sunday school program? How to decorate the church for holidays, or should a church even have a holiday? And the biggest ones that, that they discuss are Halloween and Christmas. Can Christians have tattoos? <laughs> you hope so. That's right. <laughs> or what about certain hairstyles? Can men have long hair and women have shaved hair? Amy? You hope so. <laughs> See, I'm not here to pick any sides of those. You know what those things are? Opinions. Those are things that we've come across as we have ideas on. I am not going to stand up here and say which one of those are right. Because if it's in the Bible, we'll speak about it. But if it's not in the Bible, you can have your own ideas on it. I bring them up to show that some of these things have become so contentious that many well-believing believers on both sides of the discussion have caused quarrels. One church, I know I've said this before, but it just blows my mind. One church literally split over the color of the carpet that they put on the stage. And I'm like, where is Jesus in the focus of that? One side wanted purple, one side wanted teal. Who cares? It's not in the Bible. The discussion of this has caused division and quarrels. And division is what Satan has been working on since the Garden of Eden. Satan worked to divide Adam and Eve so that they were against each other. Satan worked to bring division between mankind and God. And he has not stopped. 
in our study of Romans, Paul is showing us the basic gospel of Christ. We've been all through the book of Romans this year. He shows where believers need to be united. United on the basis of faith. United on the basis of who Jesus is. In our text for today, Paul addresses the conflict that can arise between believers. We need to know something. If there are people together, there's going to be conflict. Do you know why? Because we have different opinions. You graduated. Welcome back. I hope you noticed everybody was watching you. So Paul is calling on strong and weak Christians in this section. Now, as I said in the first sermon of the study through Romans, we have to look at context before content. Who wrote it? Who was it written to? And why? What were the events going on? And you look at that before you look at the content of that. The church in Rome Rome was a very fast-growing church. It was a very multicultural church. In this church, in Rome, there were Jewish Christians. There were Gentile Christians. There were people who used to worship false idols. There were people who used to be atheists. There were people of different ethnics, and they were all coming together. And with all those different backgrounds, there is going to be conflict. Now, we don't have that type of diversity here in St. Joe. And yet here, we still have debates. We still have conflicts. And that's what Paul is talking about today. The conflict between weak believers and strong believers. Those who are strong are often faced with the temptation to push the freedom that they know they have onto the, out to the limits because they know I can go up to this line, so I'm going to go up to this line. I'm going to come up to this area. And they push that onto other Christians who don't have that. They don't have that understanding. Those who are weak in faith are tempted the opposite way. They're so afraid of committing some sort of religious offense that they surround themselves with self-imposed restrictions. And so you have these polar opposites who are trying to come together on one thing, on Jesus. Now, although those things are not sin in themselves, certain attitudes and behaviors have destroyed fellowships, have crippled the work and the witness and the unity of countless churches throughout the ages. These problems are caused by differences between Christians on matters that are neither commanded nor forbidden, like carpet. They're matters of personal preference preference and um, historical tradition. I've heard of a church that split over Sunday school, which is not in the Bible. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It's your opinion. We need to look at what's working. Are apps bad? No. We got a new one. It's good. So every single one of us have these opinions. And just because you have an opinion, just because I have an opinion and I'm loud, doesn't make mine right. Or yours wrong. Or reverse that. So every single one of us is required to examine ourselves, not only in considering our own position on contentious issues, but how we express them in regard to other believers who hold different positions. If we cannot live in biblical harmony by loving other genuine believers who hold a different view on matters that are not salvational, that do not address Scripture then we are dishonoring Christ. We are forsaking the cross. We spoil our witness before a watching world. So let's look at what Paul says in Romans 14, verses 1 through 12. And here I've already started saying that uh, the Apostle Paul talks about two types of believers and attitudes. His first counsel is directed towards the strong believers. And I know right now you're all trying to figure out which one are you. You're either a strong or you're a weak believer. Okay? And you're trying to figure out, for this very reason, these people who are stronger, the first council is directed to the stronger believers, for this very reason, they are stronger in faith. Of the two groups, they are better equipped to understand and be understanding. So look what it says, verse 1. Accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. 
As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome, accept him. Now, I, this was a very tough text. Let me just break for a moment. And I did a lot of Greek research to make sure I could understand this because I don't want to come up here and preach something wrong because I know that one day I have to stand before God and he's going to say, why did you say it that way? I'd rather him say, you said it the right way. And so I wanted to look at this. And the Greek in here, proslambano, is a compound verb. And the prefix pros makes it a command. So when it says accept others, it is a biblical command. It's not a suggestion. Strong believers, you are commanded to welcome or accept the weak believers. In the New Testament, proslambo means receive or accept into one society, their home, circle of acquaintance. It implies that the Roman Christians were not only to tolerate the weak, but they were supposed to treat them as equal brothers and sisters in the intimate fellowship typical of the people of God. So a strong Christian is one who is mature enough to understand God's word and to be understanding to other believers. So a mature, a strong Christian is mature enough, not in knowledge, I'm not talking knowledge, to understand God's word and be understanding to other believers. We've got a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge, but then they're not understanding to others. That's one side described as one who is, okay, the strong. Then there's the one that's described one who is weak. And the Greek talks here, uh, the Greek text has a definite article meaning before faith, indicating he's not speaking of spiritual trust or faithfulness. He's not saying they, they don't have a good faith. Paul is not speaking of doctrine or moral compromise. He is speaking of believers, Jew and Gentile, who are weak in their understanding. They haven't grown much in their faith yet. They don't know how to live out the faith in Jesus. So a weak Christian is one who does not have deep understanding of the faith and does not know how to live out their faith. So they don't have a lot of knowledge and they don't know how to apply the knowledge they have yet. So when it says weak, it's not that they're bad. It's just they're brand new baby Christians. So the issue described in these verses are not, I'm going to repeat this a few times, are not about doctrine, but about personal preferences based on strengths or weaknesses of the individual's faith in the gospel. So if you have a personal idea on what you think is good or bad or right or wrong, and it's different than somebody else in this room, if it's not in the Bible, we cannot argue about it. I, I pick on this guy a lot because he likes the wrong color of tractor. Exactly. Yeah, see? But I, the reason why I pick on this guy a lot is because both of us know we don't really care. We just personally like a different color. I'm not a farmer and don't even own one, so it doesn't matter what I think. And it's not salvational, so we can have difference of opinions. And that's okay, and I know I can pick on this guy, and I'm not going to say Les's name, but I know I can pick on him because he knows, and he doesn't take it personal, and we don't hold ill will against each other. We have our own personal preference, but when it comes to scriptural mandates, doctrine, we will stand together no matter what we feel about a tractor. And that's how all of us need to be when it comes to scripture and to each other. Where the essentials of the gospel are at stake, Paul's response is very different. When it comes to personal opinion, accept each other. But when it comes to personal, or when it comes to scriptural doctrine, Paul boldly and bluntly discusses, that's sinful, you need to stop it. Period. In Romans 14, let's go to start in verse 2. Paul gives four reasons why all believers, both strong and weak, should receive, accept other believers. So let's start in verse 2. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. I like this. But another believer, believe, another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. 
those who feel free to eat anything must not look down. So the one who feels free is the strong Christian. Must not look down on those who don't, the weak Christian. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. See, the focus on these verses is the last phrase. He talks about all of it, and then it comes down to that last phrase. If you could go to the next verse, or slide. Those who feel free, this is how it could be translated. Those who feel free to eat anything, the strong, must not look down on those who don't eat it because God has accepted those who don't eat certain foods. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do eat certain foods, for God has accepted those who eat anything. So to wrap it up, no matter what you eat, God accepts you. Deal with it. It doesn't matter. I, I've, I've heard Christians fighting or debating over whether we can be vegans or uh, vegetarians or eat anything. I'll tell you what I think. I like pork. Bacon. And, and I know a Christian guy who, he doesn't eat any of that stuff. And I'm thankful. That's more for me. He can have all my green beans. But those are personal things, and I cannot look down at them and say, you're narrow-minded to think that you're honoring God better than me because I'm eating bacon. And he cannot condemn me by saying, you heathen pig eater. <laughs> because God has accepted both. Now, if you have a personal preference, great. I hope you don't like pork. I hope you don't like steak it over. I don't like cauliflower. I'll give it up for you. See, the focus is all believers, both strong and weak, should receive all other believers because God receives each believer. If God receives the one who eats nothing, certain foods and he receives the one who eats all things, who are we to say, well, God doesn't receive you? Whether you like the person or not, whether you agree with him or not, God has accepted him into the family. And if God accepts them, who are you to argue? Have you ever seen a little toddler trying to argue with their parent? And you're like, you're going to lose. Even worse, have you ever seen somebody whose dog argues with them? My brother-in-law had a dog, and he'd sit there and she'd, he'd say, sit. She'd start barking at him like they were an old married couple. And he kept telling her until she'd finally sit down and then growl. I'm like, how many times are we doing that when God the Creator is saying, hey, I'm dad, not you. That's my child you're speaking to. Let's skip down a little bit. In his first letter to Timothy, the apostle, um, the apostle writes, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some of you will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites, liars, and their conscience is dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not re reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. If God accepts it, if God says it's good, who are we to judge, right? If he says it's okay... Some believers, this is where the problem was. Some people had problems with the food that was being served at a fellowship dinner or a small group. They went to the, the marketplace and picked up the steaks that were offered to an idol. They were on discount, so the strong believers like, that's just a worthless piece of stone, and that's a good price on steak, so I'm going to do it. And the other believers like, that's idolatry by supporting them. And so there was a battle there. Was the stronger believer supporting idolatry? No, he was trying to be a good steward of his finances. Was the other one honoring God more by abstaining? No. They were both equally right in that because they were following what they knew in God. And they cannot fight or argue about it. 
Okay, go to verse 3, 14, 3. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't and those who don't eat certain foods. Look how this verse is translated in these others. The one who eats must not look down on. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt. Let the one who eats not despise or hate. But you should not criticize. See, the one who is strong in faith should not look down on, should not criticize, should not despise them for their lack of knowledge. If you want to do that because you have stronger faith, you are basically telling a little toddler who keeps falling down because they're trying to walk and saying, you're a numbskull because you don't know how to walk yet. And if you talk to a child like that, you deserve slapped. And so if you're doing that in your faith to somebody else who is weaker in faith, you deserve slapped. Because we are not to criticize, despise, or regard with contempt. Paul is not saying dislike. The word here really means on the border of hate. And many Jews and Greeks fought over what was clean and unclean to eat. Some thought they were evil for eating certain foods, and the, the Gentiles thought the Jews were barbaric. They were uncivilized. But in that same verse, verse 3, look at the next one. Verse 3, Paul addresses the next side. Those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. The one who does not eat is not to judge. Let the one who abstains not pass judgment or not criticize. So the other one's not supposed to despise or hate because they have a little more understanding, maturity in their faith. The younger is not to pass judgment. To condemn translates a very strong Greek word. It's called krino, which means separating and isolating. You are not to take that strong believer who, you, who does not agree with you and isolate them out of the faith. See, the weaker faith person sees somebody eating food as a spiritual crime and they pass a judgment. Oh, you're evil. You hate God. And so therefore, I am right. The weaker in faith actually elevates themselves by passing a judgment on the stronger. And the stronger just look at them as, you're an idiot and um, I don't need to listen to you. And they, can, they just criticize and start hate and bitterness. And in all of that, the question is, where's God? Unfortunately, Christians often only welcome those that are like themselves. I found this poem, and it, it is so sad. Somebody actually wrote this. Believe as I believe, no more, no less, that I am right and no one else confess. Feel as I feel, think only as I think. Eat what I eat and drink what I drink. Look as I look, do always as I do. Then and only then will I fellowship with you. And while we can sit here and go, that is horrible, how many of us actually tend towards that? It is incredibly sad that people fall. I was at a church and we wanted to do some ministering and do some evangelism work to this area that was a very low income trailer park area that had a lot of crime, a lot of drugs in the area. And one of the elders says, we don't want people like that here. They're just going to bring trouble and problems here. And I'm like, ah, wow. So now you get to decide who can be saved or not based on where they live. See, a stronger faith was looking down on contempt with someone who didn't even have faith yet. As Christians, we cannot let that be our attitude. All believers, both strong and weak in faith, should receive others because God receives them. Also, we need to receive all believers because the Lord sustains each believer. Verse 4, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Basically, I'm, I'm going to kind of go quick through this. You are not to look at the other person and say you have better faith because God is the one who strengthens each one of us. And he is their Lord and Savior, not you. And who are you to go up to somebody and say, you know what? Man, God hates you. 
when you are not the master. He is. You are not to look down. And Paul confronts both sides here. There are two very famous Christians in the Victorian era in England. One was Charles Spurgeon, and the other one was Joseph Parker. They, many, um, these guys were mighty preachers of the gospel. In early ministries, they fellowshiped together, and they often had pulpit swaps. They got along really well until they had a disagreement. And their disagreement caused a division amongst them, and it made it into the secular newspapers. Spurgeon accused Parker of being unspiritual because he attended the theater. Now, I'm not talking like heap show style. I'm talking just, he went to see plays and stuff. And Spurgeon says that is wrong as a Christian. Parker looked at Spurgeon and said, well, you smoke cigars. Why can you preach the gospel? Now, who was right? Neither. Because they put their opinions over the unifying message of Christ. And they caused a division. Since Jesus Christ is Lord, we submit to Him and we let him deal with his people as he wishes on non-scriptural issues. All believers, both strong and weak, should receive others because the Lord is sovereign to each believer. Sovereign means supreme, ruler, self-governing, superior, or matchless. Look at what it says, verses 5 through 9. In the same way, meaning go back, in the same way, the weak and strong, in all those things, some think one day is more holier than the other day. They talk about Saturday or Sunday services. While others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kinds of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to the Lord before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if it's to die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be, both Lord, uh, to be Lord over both the living and the dead. So if you feel strongly that you should worship on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Tuesday or whatever day, do it. If you feel like only one day... Do it. And don't argue about it. What is arguing going to do anyway? Whether strong or weak, sincere believers feel free or not free to do certain things, we are to do it to honor and please the Lord, not each other. If I am coming to church to please you, I have taken my eyes off God. So we need to focus on him. Paul is giving a twofold command here. Do not compromise your own conscience in order to conform to the conscience of another believer. So don't change your conscience just to be like someone else. And do not attempt to lead another believer to compromise their conscience. So don't change yours to fit them and don't make them fit yours on non-scriptural matters. Don't force your personal non-salvational issue on other people. I grew up, Mom, if you're watching this, I love you. I grew up where you always had to dress up for church, even Wednesday night youth group. I had to wear corduroy to youth group. So here's me going to youth group. Whoop, 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 whoop. I hate corduroy now. Yeah, Mom, you know this. I hated it. And finally, somebody went to my mom. And she goes, but you need to put your best for it. You need to do it. And he looked at it. He goes, we're playing tag for part of it. And he's out there. <laughs> he almost started a fire. <laughs> and it was nuts. And so you know what my mom did? She, Why don't you start wearing shorts? And I loved youth group then. They didn't hear me. <laughs> See, she, was, she had this idea that she wanted to do her best to honor God in everything, even her clothing, which is God-honoring and great. But we cannot shove that on somebody else and look down on them, which my mom didn't. You didn't look down on me, Mom. You were just trying to raise me. 
But we can't take that to extreme and force them. You've got to dress in corduroy for church. You have to wear a suit and tie. Or don't dress up at all. You need to just come as you are and look down on those who do dress up. See, it's both sides. I'm not coming here to impress you. And you better not be coming here to impress me. We come here to honor God because He is sovereign. He is our Lord. And that's why we come. Finally, all believers, both strong and weak, should receive all other believers because the Lord alone will condemn each believer. Romans 14 says, So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on a believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow or bend to me. Every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Paul asks, Why do you the weak Pass judgment on those who have stronger faith. Why are you condemning them? Or why do you despise your brother of weaker faith with contempt because they don't understand yet? The work of Christians is to serve the Lord, not assume His Lordship. I am not to sit on the, the throne of heaven and call out judgments of my own. Now I can say these are what God's judgments are. And a scripturally thing, I can say this is what God says here, you and I, you and I need to do this. But I can't come and say, you know what, worshiping on Saturday or Sunday or Tuesday is wrong. You need to do it my way. The work of Christians is to serve Him, not assume His Lordship. Although those who have repented of sin and believed in Jesus have already been justified by faith, we will not face condemnation on the final day. God is still going to, according to this, judge our works and reward them accordingly. I've been baptized. I've been raised in the faith. I have grown in it. That does not mean I get a free pass to do whatever I think I want to do. Because that means he's not my Lord and sovereign. I do what my master says. Now again, Paul is not talking about confronting a believer about some sin. Some harmful action or attitude to the faith. Those should, and according to scripture, should be dealt with up front with those individuals. Not to slam them, not to kick them, but to bring them up in righteousness. We can't condone sinfulness and hide it under a rug. We call it out. But he is talking about things that are not salvational. Our job is not to judge unjustly or what is unjust. Our responsibility is not to despise or criticize or belittle brothers and sisters in Christ. We will not be called on our Lord to give account on what this person did in their faith. You and I will be called account on what we did with our own. What we allowed in our own lives. And if I allow sin in my lives, that is not your fault. Unless you did nothing to stop me and hinder it. But if I allow certain activities that you just don't like, like driving a green tractor, then that's between me and God. Because it's an opinion. See the difference? There's opinions, and then there's doctrine. And here's where the messiness comes in. Sometimes those seem to go like this. We think, well, my opinion is scriptural, and I justify it. And, and when we do that, sometimes we just kick them. Or sometimes we push them away and think, you know what, I don't care. This is what I'm, I'm living my life. I had a bad attitude towards my mother because of corduroy. I did for the longest time. And just in the last three years, I started wearing corduroy again. Because it's okay. My attitude about a non-scriptural thing made me look down and not like youth group for a while. Because of a weak faith, I was really upset with somebody who had a strong faith over corduroy. And really, how dumb is that? I, I knew a guy who he went up to somebody and said, we love that you're coming to church, but 
you stink. Can you sit in the foyer? I like proper hygiene. Teenagers, boys, please listen to that. Okay? I know another guy, he went to a church service in Florida. He was on vacation, and they didn't pack a bunch of clothes, and so he walked into church service pretty much like Jason, in a t-shirt and shorts. Nothing wrong, and a guy came up to him and handed him a suit coat and a tie and said, you need to put this on. This guy is a preacher at another church. They just assumed he's a heathen who didn't know anything, and you've got to look just right to come before God. We've got to set aside these worldly ideas that are not scriptural and just accept each other. Because when it said he made them in his image, it wasn't Adam looked exactly like God. It was when Adam and Eve came together, then their uniqueness and their differences, they resemble the characters of God. If you look around here, we don't have anybody who looks identical. We got some that you can obviously tell our family. Yeah, Katie's like, well, yeah, that's true. Shouldn't we all look like family of God in our attitude and actions and not in our judgment? The Baptist boy suggested to his little girl neighbor um, who went to a Methodist church, he came over and says, I'd like to play. And so they went outside playing and he said, let's play church. And he was really excited about that. And she said, let me, let me go make sure I can. She ran inside the house all excited, came out kind of dropping her head. Mother says we can't play church because we belong to different abominations. <laughs> Whenever we have divisions amongst believers, it is an abomination. Because Jesus said, let them be united as you and I. And he's talking to God the Father. So let the Christians be united just as much as Jesus was united with God the Father. Even though many people belong to a different church, I'm going to say something a little bit weird for some of you. I do not believe all Christians in heaven will belong to the Church of Christ Christian Church. I don't. I do believe there will be some Methodists, Baptists, and, and some others in heaven. Because it's not about the church name. It's about the name of Jesus. Uh, I also believe there will be people who went to the Church of Christ Christian Church who don't make it to heaven. Because they worship the name on the church instead of the author of the book. So here's one last phrase I was challenged with. And this phrase really, really made me think. Because I don't care, I don't want to care what church you go to. There are some churches, I'll just say, and I'm not going to say which ones right now, they are wrong, they teach wrong doctrine. And doctrine needs confronted when it goes against this. But other than the doctrinal things, here's the phrase that a guy challenged me with. I would rather accept someone God has rejected than reject somebody God has accepted. Now really think about that. I would rather accept somebody that has not accepted God, that God has not said is in the family yet, than for me to say you are not good enough to be in the family when God's already said that's my child. Because if I reject somebody God's accepted, I'm putting myself in God's place. And if I, ex if I accept somebody that God hasn't accepted, maybe that's just the sign Maybe that's just the avenue that's going to help them say, I want to be a part of a God like that. So which are you going to do? We always have a time of invitation. But right now I want you to look. Look at the fellow believers. I want heaven to be jam-packed. I want to make Jesus so busy right now making homes in heaven that he gets tired and God can't get tired. 
And the only way to do that is to start getting out there and living the precepts of the scripture and not saying, I'm better than you, do my way, but to say, Jesus is better. He accepted me. You've got a great chance. So what will you do? Let's stand. Let's worship the God who accepts everybody, including you and me.